don't know how much you pay attention to uh, the Miss Universe pageant. I really don't at all. But this week I heard an interesting story from that. And in the uh, Miss Puerto Rico pageant leading up to the Miss Universe pageant, Ingrid Rivera was in that pageant and she was by far favored to win. And the other girls uh, got together and started plotting a way to figure out to take her down so that somebody else could have a chance to win this. And uh, they plotted together, they made sneaky plans, and one thing didn't work, another thing kind of worked, whatever. But in the end, one of the girls, I don't know who it was, but one of the girls doused her gown and her makeup with pepper spray. And so she got dressed and went out on stage, and somehow, throughout the time on stage in front of the judges, she held her composure remarkably well. But guess what? As soon as she got backstage, right, instantly get that gown off and, and get ice packs. Her face was starting to swell up and, and all that kind of She eventually won. But my thought was, what lengths will people go? What lengths will people go to to get their own way? Or when someone else looks like they have the advantage? Or, or when things uh, change and adjust and I don't like it? What, what lengths will people go to? Uh, looking back over my life, I got in a lot of trouble for exactly this kind of thing. I grew up with, uh, I call it now a, a strategic mind, but I wouldn't have called it that when I was a teenager. It was a sneaky, devious mind. And I could always find a way to work myself into the right place to set things up so it was to my advantage. I remember volunteering with the organization of sports leagues that I played in. I got to do the schedule for a couple of years for a football team I played on. And uh, I totally set the schedule up to our advantage. And I think about times that, that I got in trouble for that. I'm not real proud of that. But as I worked through this this week, I had to admit that, that I see a lot of myself in my life in that. Thank God that we are not controlled by sin anymore. It's still there. It's like burning embers underneath that could flare up at any time. But all that to say, when somebody has a plan that gets in your way, or you don't like it, what lengths will we do, will we go to, to, make, to, 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 to undercut that, or to change it, or get in its way? Now, now think way bigger. What if, it's, what if it's something our country is doing? or our city is doing, or maybe our church is doing. And I'm not in favor. It really messes me up. How do we respond to that? Well, this morning we're going to take a quick look through chapters 4 to 7 of Nehemiah. We're not going to read all of it. Um, but we'll read little bits of it. But I want to work through that whole chunk uh, quickly because what I see in there are two separate game plans for thwarting, for foiling, for, for destroying somebody else's plans. Let me pray. And Father, as we dig into your word, will you make it come alive for us? This message this morning is so simple. But God, in its simplicity, will you change our hearts? Will you open our eyes? Help us to, to call sin, sin and deal with it, and repent, and run to you. God, we want to live godly lives. We want to respond in godly ways. We want to be a light and a, and a salt in a world that desperately needs you. So God, uh, as we shape as a church, as we shape as our character, God, would you use these things to call us forward, compel us towards you. So God, speak to us this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Last week, uh, if you were here, we met the haters, the three gentlemen that uh, took it upon themselves to absolutely oppose and destroy the plan, God's plan, to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. Sanballat, who was the governor of Samaria, they were squashed people by the Israelites, they were pushed aside, and it was good for them that Jerusalem was in ruins. And here Jerusalem is getting built up again. We met Tobiah, who married 
into the, the family of the priests. He married the, the daughter of one of the priests of Israel, so he's in the core family, but very, very against. We don't know why he's so angry against Jerusalem. And Geshem, who is the ruler uh, just east of Jerusalem, and his people had sort of occupied Jerusalem in its ruins when it was beat up. And, and um, he was also very wealthy from the spice trade. And uh, when, if Jerusalem had been, was rebuilt and it became a powerful city again, then that's going to hurt his, his business. So they all had their nice little worlds that they had built up. They had their nice ways that were threatened. What took them years to establish was falling apart. So even if, even if they thought what they were doing was right, was the right thing, it was in the way of what God wanted to do. It's God's people, compelled by God's vision, seeing God's provision, following God's heart. That's where we were last week. So what if I don't like where we're going? Could be elections, could be a new coach on your hockey team, family decisions, the boss's new rules, neighbors, my neighbor's landscaping, church budget, a planning committee, um, it could be all kinds of different things. And I think as we look at the opposition here in these chapters, for whatever reason, I think we start to see very clearly two different plans. So two ways to thwart somebody else's plans. How's that? And as we go, we're just going to build the, the lists of those things on the screen. So it's a good test for Josh upstairs this morning to, to stay with us. So if you have your Bibles, go to uh, Nehemiah chapter 4. And I'm going to just start in verse 1. And I'm going to read little bits of it and I'll stop and interject. I'm not going to talk for a long time on any of these things. As it builds on the screen behind me, you'll see where it's going. And then we'll comment on the end. Chapter 4. Now when Sambalat heard that we were building the wall, he was angry and greatly enraged. The first thing right off the bat. When someone else's plans are being achieved and it's messing me up, the first danger, the first risk, the first sign of something's off is anger. And it's interesting, not just anger, he was greatly enraged. And he jeered at the Jews. Verse 2, And he said in the presence of his brothers and of the army of Samaria, What are these feeble Jews doing? Will they restore it for themselves? Will they sacrifice? Will they finish it up in a day? Will they revive the stones out of the heaps of the rubbish? The burned ones at that? I just see, uh, you know, the old cartoons where you had the, the villain who's the great big guy. And he's going and going. And then the, who, what's beside him? The little guy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, that's what we got happening here. Sambalad's jeering and calling. He's got this huge group of people together and he's mocking them. And then beside him, Tobiah the Ammonite was behind, beside him saying, yeah, yeah. What, if, what are they building if a fox goes up it? It's going to break down. Like they're just, they're just doing everything they can to mock and to pull them down. And, and interesting here, what I see, the next stage after the anger was here are these guys that were angry. They started talking. And convincing others and building their little circle of people, building their network of people with their perspective. Do you see that? That's an interesting way. Think of where we're going. And, and so to thwart someone else's plan, right, you get angry and then we start talking about it and build my circle, my network. Verse 4, how do the other people respond? Nehemiah says, Hear, O our God, for we are despised. Turn back their taunt on their own heads and give them up to be plundered in a land where they are captives. Do not cover their guilt. Do not let their sin be blotted out from your sight, for they have provoked you to anger in the presence of the builders. Uh, the other plan we see for step one is what? Pray. Interesting, different starting point. The one group of people, the first starting point is anger. The other group of people, the starting point is prayer. Verse 6. So we built the wall, and the wall was joined together to half its heights, for the people had a mind to work. There's step two in the plan. Work ethic. Up, up the expectations. Let's work hard. 
Verse 7. When Sambalat and Tobiah, the Arabs and the Ammonites and the Ashdites, heard that the repairing of the walls of Jerusalem were going forward and that the breaches were beginning to be closed, they were very angry. So you see already he's got more people involved in this. It started to be three. Now there's the Arabs, the Ammonites, the Ashdites, this group's building. He's building his little circle of hate here. And they got together, in verse 8, and plotted together to come and fight against Jerusalem and to cause confusion. So this group, this network that he built of haters, now is getting together to plot and plan to bring confusion and frustration. Verse 9, And we prayed to our God and set a guard against them that night. See the difference? What's happening here? Two different plans going completely in different directions. Verse 10, In Judah it was said, The strength of those who bear the burdens is falling. There is too much rubble. By ourselves, we will not be able to rebuild it. The people building the walls started to listen. They started to hear the rumors. They started to hear the threats. And they started to get doubt in their heads. This is too big. This is too much. We can't do it. And then if you look at verse 12, I'll come back to verse 11. At that same time, Jews who lived other places were calling them saying, Oh, forget it. Just come home. Just return to us. Forget the rebuilding. So, so not only were they hearing the words from, from the enemies, in a sense, they were hearing words from each other to just give up. They've lost it. They're getting doubt. And then verse 11, And our enemies said, They will not know or see till we come among them and kill them and stop the work. They won't know what's coming. They won't even see it coming. We're way more powerful than they think. And we'll sneak right in. There's another part of their plan. Verse 13. So in the lowest parts of the space behind the wall, in open places, I stationed people by their clans with their swords, their spears, and their bows. So next on the other side is stay awake. Let's be alert. Let's be ready. Let's be prepared. But let's keep going. And I looked and arose and said to the nobles and to the officers and to the rest of the people, do not be afraid of them. Remember the Lord who is great and awesome and fight for your brothers, your sons, your daughters, your wives, and your homes. Remember. Remember, God. We're, we're afraid. We're starting to doubt. They've instilled fear in us. But remember, this is God's plan. This is God's vision. It's God who has come and asked us. It's God who will fight for us. So there's a huge encouragement as part of their plan. Verse 15 to the end of that chapter, I'm not going to read all of it, but this describes how that they continued to work. And as every day, uh, some people held spears and some people work, and then eventually everybody labored with one hand on their work and one hand on their weapon until the wall was continued to be built. And we come to verse chapter 5. Now there arose a great outcry of the people and of their wives against their Jewish brothers. For there were those who said, With our sons and our daughters we are many. So let us get grain that we may eat and keep alive. There were those who, who said, We are mortgaging our fields and our vineyards and our houses to get grain because of the famine. And we're borrowing money, and the king is taxing us, and we're forcing our sons and daughters to be slaves, and other people are holding our vineyards and our fields. And Nehemiah steps in and says uh, in verse 7, you are extracting, exacting interest on each other, and the thing you are doing in verse 9 is not good. You ought to walk in the fear of the Lord. So what happens here? is in the midst of the building, just amongst the Jews, we see life has continued on. There's a famine. They're not getting enough to eat. They're having to mortgage their houses, and, and uh, uh, people that they're in debt to are taking their fields and their vineyards and all that kind of stuff, and the world keeps getting smaller and smaller, and it's becoming more and more difficult. And then Jews lending money to Jews are charging interest, and it's squashing the entire thing. 
Now, in their law, they were not allowed to charge interest. You loan money, you loan money, but you can't charge interest. And, and so they're breaking the law. And he's, he's, Nehemiah calls them out and says, this is not good. And they agreed together, in verse 12, to restore the things that they had done. And all the assembly, in verse 13, said, Amen. And the people did as they had promised. So I see in part of this plan is to call sin, sin, recognize sin, clean it up, purge sin from our community. We need to live together in a healthy community. And that's part of the strategic plan is be healthy together and be right with God. How are we doing? We're staying on track. Good job up there. In, uh, in the continuing of that chapter, I won't read 14 to the end of that chapter. We see a great picture, and this isn't on there. Nehemiah, the leader, is ridiculously generous and selfless in this. And come to chapter 6, and we come back to Sambalat and Tobiah and Geshem. And the rest of the enemies heard that the, the, about the wall, and there was no breach left. And Sambalat and Geshem said, sent to me, saying, Come meet with us together. They had harm, if you continue to read that. They intended harm. And so what did they do? They're saying, come meet with us in our place. And as we read the story, their, their expectation was, we've got this now, this big network, this circle of people that are hate, haters trying to stop this. And they say to Nehemiah, come on over, we want to meet with you. But their plan was to gang up on him and to kill him. He says, he responds three or four times, I'm, I'm working, I can't come down, I'm not going to let the work stop. That happens four times. So part of this strategic plan then is, let's get together and let's gang up on him. And then verse 5, in the same way, Sambalat, the fifth time, sent his servant to me with an open letter. Do you know what that means? An open letter would be, if a courier was taking a letter from me to you and it was an open letter, the courier would make sure every single person could read that letter. It would be read publicly. It would be open. And so it was something, an open letter meant everyone, from the lowest to the highest, everyone needs to read this. All right? So Sambalat sends an open letter, and this is what it said. It's reported among the nations... And Geshem also says it, that you and the Jews intend to rebel. That is why you're building the wall. And according to these reports, you wish to become their king. And you've set up prophets to proclaim you in Jerusalem. There is a king in Judah. And now the king will hear, now the king, King Artaxerxes, will hear of these reports. So come now and let's meet together. You see what he'd done? He started crazy rumors. He, start, he started rumors and spread it like crazy to take Nehemiah down. In verse 8, Nehemiah says, Then I sent to him, saying, No such things as you say have been done, for you are inventing them out of your own mind. For they all wanted to frighten us, thinking their hands will drop from the work, and it will not be done. So to counter the lies the other side of the plan is going to stick to truth. Stick to truth. The, the end of that verse, but now, O oh God, strengthen my hands. So they pray again. Verse 10. And when I went to the house of Shemaiah, the son of Deliah, the son of Mehedabal, who was confined to his home and said, let us meet together in the house of God within the temple. Let us close the doors of the temple, for they are coming to kill you. They are coming to kill you by night. So here's a guy in Jerusalem. He's confined to his home. He's not out building. And he calls Nehemiah and says, Quick, get in the temple. Lock yourself in. Your enemies are coming to kill you. That's what he said. And Nehemiah says in verse 11, But should a man as I run away... And what man such as I could go to the temple and live, I will not go in. And I understood and saw that God had not sent him, but he had pronounced the prophecy against me because Tobiah and Sambalat had hired him. For this purpose he was hired, that I should be afraid and act in a way of sin. So what's that part of the plan? Let's find somebody on the inside 
who they trust and get him to set up the evil for us. Verse 14, what is the response of the other side? Oh my God, according to these things that they did, and also the prophetess Nodiah, and the rest of the prophets who wanted to make me afraid, he prayed. Oh my God, he prayed. Are you seeing a difference between these two plans? I hope you are. Verse 16, down to the end of that chapter, we see that Tobiah, Tobiah is the guy who married into the, the priest's family. He has a lot of people in Judah who are bound to oath by him, which means maybe they owed him money or favors or he had done things for him. He had a lot of relationship things going on. And what he does is he's working those people for info. He's working them for info, and they spoke of how great Tobiah is, in verse uh, 19, and reported all these things to Nehemiah. So what Tobiah is doing is he's got all these, these, uh, these people relationally connected or indebted to him that he's using as pawns in his power play and trying to spread the net from within to make Nehemiah fall. And then, the end of that verse, Tobiah sent letters to make me afraid. He continues to pursue and to pester, building fear, sending letters and letters and letters and letters and letters to create more and more fear. The beginning of chapter 7, and now the wall had been built, and I had set up the doors, and the gatekeepers and the singers and the Levites had been appointed. They finished the wall. Now go back to chapter 6, verse 15, and I skipped over this on purpose. So the wall was finished on the 25th day of the month of Elul in 52 days. In 52 days, they built the entire wall. They finished it. And it was clear to the enemies that God had done it. And that, as much as anything else, instilled all kinds of fear in the enemy. But I want to look at this for a second. That's a lot of stuff. And I don't usually like having a whole ton of words on the screen. There's a lot of stuff, but that's pretty simple. Is that not straightforward? Let me pull all this together. There is always opposition. We will always have differences. And people have a right to speak to it and to protest And often those kind of things are necessary. But how we go about that is absolutely critical. I think one of the key things in this is that we need to call sin, sin. And as I look at these lists here, one of these lists, everything on that is deceptive and undercutting and selfish and sneaky. It's sin. And it has no place here. Interesting, in the middle of all of this, in chapter 1, what we saw was a whole chapter almost committed to confession and repentance. Here in the middle of all of this confusion and enemies and building and everything, we have a whole chapter committed to confession and repentance. The next three chapters, and Nathan will be talking about next week, are committed to confession and repentance. In the middle of all of this, that's huge. In my life, in your life, in our church, which list will we pursue? Will we call sin, sin, and purge? Those are two absolutely critical things here. Call sin, sin. And the second thing, if we go back to last week, Call God's plan, God's plan. Because if we know it's God's plan, then it's God's plan. And will we come along? Will we band together? Will we pull together to make it work? It was absolutely critical. We talked about this last week. It was absolutely critical that these people knew that it was God's plan to rebuild the wall. They needed to know how God had worked Nehemiah's heart. They needed to know how God had worked King Artaxerxes' heart. They needed to know that God was the one who provided all of the resources, that his fingerprints was all over this. They needed to know that. 
And when our board comes up with direction and vision for us, and we make decisions, we need to know that they have done the due diligence and the seeking God and, and the significant time in that. If, if God gives the vision and direction, will they band together to make it happen? As a church family, as a fellowship of people united to accomplish God's purposes in the big things and in the little things, not just church stuff, but our lives in relationship to God's character. Do we see ourselves in these lists? I think God's word is clear. So God's people, compelled by God's vision, not my vision or your vision, God's vision, seeing God's provision, following God's heart. God gives the vision and direction. Will they band together to make it happen? Will we? The key phrase in that sentence, or the key couple of words is band together. In ancient Israel, one of the things that uh, historians tell us is to sit together around a table and to eat together was a serious deal. You did not sit at a table and eat with someone that you were in disagreement with. That was against all of their cultural rules. To sit around a table and eat together was a huge deal of communion, of unity, of togetherness, of single-mindedness, of purpose and intent and love. And we, right now, are going to sit around a table together in communion. I'm going to ask the servers and the musicians if you'll come and, and find your positions now. You can take a minute to get ready. One of the most important together things that we can do as a church is the Lord's Supper. In unity, in community, in unison, in communion with one another. To come together now around the Lord's table. So we're going to do this. We're going to come to the table in groups of six or seven. And there's tables all around the room, so just go to the one that's closest to you. Please don't line up. When a table is finished, then make your way up to the table for the next round. Don't line up. Um, the servers at each table will guide you through the process. They will give you the instructions. They will read scripture. They will pray with you. They will lead you in communion together. And sometimes when we have communion Sometimes when we approach the Lord's table, it is a real personal thing. And it's me and God, and I have an intimate moment myself with God. Sometimes when we come to the Lord's table, it's a little bit more like it was in the early church. It's not about me. This is us and God. And so we're going to focus on that part of it today. Today, let's consciously, together, let's emphasize the together part of this and the unity part of this. As we worship him, as we remember his death, his burial, and his resurrection, and his gift of salvation for us. Let me pray, and then as Jamie leads us in the first song, um, just make your way to the tables, and we'll go until we're done. Is that fair? And we'll worship together. Let's pray. Our Father, we thank you for your word. As simple as this is today, and, and as unorthodox as that message was. God, it's just a simple message of how we should be treating each other, how we should be treated, treating each other as a church and in our communities and at work and at school. God, may we live lives that please you. May we call sin, sin. Get on board with where you are going. And God, if we disagree or if we're angered because something's going on that messes stuff up, God, may we take the approach of prayer, of hard work, of prayer, of being ready and preparedness and of prayer and of purging sin and confessing and of prayer. And God, we see that so clearly. This is the posture you have for us. 
So God, would you rid us from the desires to sneak around and undercut what other people are doing, or or even worse, the, the vision you have given us. Thank you, Father, now for the opportunity to sit around tables together because we are together. We are a family. And if nothing else, we are bound together because of the blood of Jesus. Thank you for the gift of salvation. Thank you for purchasing us back from sin and from ourselves that we might live to honor you. So God, give us a wonderful time of remembering and of celebrating together. In Jesus' name, amen.